The Battlefront Classic Collection is out, so it's a good time to talk about some of the weirder bits of lore in Battlefront 2, inspired by this suggestion from Yannick on the Discord. Today I'll be going over three of the decisions I think stand out the most, at least to me, with respect to how the game deviates from established lore as it existed at the time of the game's release. Obviously, gameplay always has to take precedence in a game like this, which we'll talk about a bit, so I'm mostly trying to stick to areas where I think some more lore-friendly options existed without impacting the core concepts of the game. And I'm also going to try to keep in mind the ability to have certain iconic or recognizable elements in the game compared to just pulling things from more obscure sources even if I do personally love me some obscure sources. The first thing has to do with the selection of roles for starfighters in the game. I actually don't think the specific examples Yannick mentions in their suggestion of the TIE fighters with proton torpedoes stick out as that strange. Those kind of specific loadout changes fit pretty well within the realm of game design and balance decisions, even if it's not necessarily the most lore-friendly thing. The fighters have few differences between the factions, so they tend to pretty much just be reskins of each other. If we are going to go full lore nerd on this, there are games like X-Wing and TIE Fighter where there were other fighter types which could fill these roles a bit more closely, like the Imperial Alpha Class XG-1 Starwing from Star Wars X-Wing. But I'm just bringing that up for the extra bit of lore trivia, rather than because I think that's something the game should have done instead of the TIE Fighter. I think when discussing lore and retcons, you kind of have to take into account what the purpose of the story or game or whatever you're talking about is. In Battlefront 2, I think you have to take into account that they're really trying to represent any conflict between the Imperials and Rebels, so you kind of want to get the average of that experience, which is why going with something that's more iconic like the TIE Fighter, even if it's used a bit out of role, makes more sense than if you went with something more obscure, but which had a more appropriate loadout by default. When it comes to gameplay, there's always going to be a concession there, and this kind of thing can often be how new variants show up in the lore anyways. Ground is a bit of a different story, where you end up with things like the Galactic Marine armor style just being labeled Clone Commanders, which really makes you wonder how the command structure worked on Maegido with so many commanders around, ironically with only Commander Bakara, the actual commander, not wearing the armor that Battlefront 2 says is for Clone Commanders. But while I think those Starfighter loadout adjustments are appropriate, I think the Republic has at least one fighter which really sticks out like a sore thumb, not just as having an adjusted loadout, but an entirely unsuitable role, the V-Wing, which is really more of an interceptor, but it gets slotted in as a bomber for the Republic, equivalent to the Heavy Belbalab, the Y-Wing for the Rebels, and the TIE Bombers for the Empire. And I think this isn't just weird from a lore standpoint, it kind of doesn't read very well in-game either. If you were looking at all of the ships for the Republic in a lineup, I don't know that anyone would pick out the V-Wing as the heavy bomber, or that they'd look at the V-Wing and the group of other bombers and say, yeah, that makes sense. Pandemic, the game's developers really seemed to want to keep the ARC-170 more in line with what the X-Wing was doing because of the visual similarity. And then with the Ada-2 as the interceptor, they just had to shove the V-Wing in the bomber slot. I think that, assuming they wanted to keep things as closely tied to the movie content or other visual mediums that existed as they could, which seems to be the impetus behind some of these choices, especially when it comes to the Clone Wars content in the game, they should have actually put the ARC-170 in the bomber slot, used the V-Wing as the interceptor, and then they could have used the V-19 Torrent from the 2003 animated series leading up to the Revenge of the Sith as the fighter type, which wouldn't have been all that obscure of a pull at that point. They could even switch the Torrent and Arc-170 in that if they really wanted to use the Arc in a more X-Wing style role, which really is appropriate for it. It's just that we're trying to look at what they had available and the choices they could have made with these things, and I think putting the V-Wing where it was was easily one of the weirdest decisions they could have made in this situation. If you want to eliminate some of that reliance on the movies and look a bit broader, there are some other bomber options that are technically available. The Revenge of the Sith Incredible Cross Sections book, which released in April 2005 compared to the October 2005 release date for Battlefront 2, included the first mention of the NTB bomber, something that has never actually been properly depicted, but was a Republic bomber in the wider expanded universe at the time. But as a whole, Republic bombers were an area that were kind of slim pickings at the time, and even with the CIS that was kind of the case. The Belbalab in Battlefront 2, the CIS bomber, which was later retconned in the Clone Wars campaign guide as the Belbalab 24 Strike, bomber was a bit of a choice by Battlefront as well, putting the ship in a role that it wasn't necessarily intended to be in originally. The most iconic, dedicated, and widely recognizable bombers for the Republican CIS didn't actually come until a couple years later in the Clone Wars cartoon, where we got the Y-Wing variant for the Republic, 
and the Hyena for the CIS. All of these choices I think were pretty clearly influenced by an attempt to keep the prequel movies front and center, and that extends to things like the Lat being used for the Rebel landing ship. This one in particular feels like a missed opportunity to have come up with their own Rebel dropship. There are again some assault transports from X-Wing and TIE Fighter which could have fit here, but I'm not going to hold them to using those like I've said before. And Battlefront on Ground has introduced some of my favorite vehicle designs like the AAC. It's not like the introduction of new designs was off limits in space because of the need to use movie material, especially when they went with this weird Mon Calamari ship variant rather than the more iconic Liberty design. The lab being in space at all is also a bit of its own discussion, but there's been enough places where lats have been shown to be capable of operating in space, at least in certain variants, that I'm not going to worry about that very much. Keeping things in space for number two, the choices made about the escort frigates have always been weird to me as well. The capital ships make sense, save for the strange MC-80 I just talked about, and the changes for the hardpoints and primary hangar locations also make sense for gameplay, but the choices for escort frigates raise some questions for why certain things were made to be equivalent. In the Clone Wars, I think the Acclimator and Munificent make perfect sense for their chosen roles here, but the design of the Munificent is this weird little stubby thing, so is that really a lore complaint? I think it is, but feel free not to count it for this. In the Galactic Civil War, it is pretty weird putting the CR-90 on the same level as these much bigger Clone Wars ships for the Rebellion, and then the Empire just has the Victory 2 frigate. I won't go after them for making a new ship type after just saying they should have done that for the Rebel dropship, but I do think if they wanted to match the Rebels and keep the CR-90 there, the Lancer Frigate would have been a perfectly good choice without having too big of a discrepancy in ship capabilities. Another good choice which should have been considered at the time would have been liking and subscribing for more. The Lancer is 250 meters compared to the CR-90's 150, and it is proportionally more powerful, but that's all within the scope of what the game is trying to do, and where gameplay decisions could trump lore, while still keeping things true to their intent. They could also have made things bigger and gone for the Nebulon B, pairing that with a Carrick class cruiser, or keeping that matched against their bespoke Victory 2 frigate. But even the Nebulon B is only about 300 meters long, so size-wise it could have paired up against the Lancer as well. Finally, the last of the weird lore choices we'll be talking about today is the use of the same clone trooper in the 501st for the campaign the entire way through. The first mission in the campaign is Maegito, or Geonosis if you want to count the tutorial, and then they're present for every mission up until the Battle of Hoth, with the retired clone trooper voiced by Tamura Morrison narrating the whole thing. I get why they'd want to use Tamura as much as possible, but having these clone troopers being the core of the 501st for the whole time doesn't really make any sense. I doubt the ones in the Empire service would have had their rapid aging fix like some in the Expanded Universe did when they went out on their own, so by the time the Battle of Hoth happens, these clones which are apparently still in active duty pretty commonly, would have been about the biological age of 70, significantly older than even Rex in Rebels was, let alone the 501st becoming a kind of Star Wars Forrest Gump, where they're present for basically every major event in galactic history. Ultimately, Battlefront 2 isn't a game that rests heavily on its story, so it's all just a framing device and probably not something other stories were ever going to lean too heavily on for inspiration. But especially given half the campaign is the Galactic Civil War, and the things I talked about before with how some of the Galactic Civil War content was chosen, it does seem like it's trying a bit too hard to capitalize on the prequel hype to keep people interested, thinking they just won't care about the Galactic Civil War on its own, and trying to split that into its own separate campaign. They probably could even have the story be pretty much exactly what it was, but change it a little bit to have the narrative reflect the clones being tossed aside. This was a while before clones really got examined as their own characters and anything, so Battlefront even going as far as it did in representing that really did take things in a novel direction. But going about it in this specific way does make it a bit incompatible with other lore surrounding the clone troopers. That's going to do it for today though, I hope you've enjoyed this look at some of the weirder lore choices around Battlefront 2. If so, remember to leave a like and subscribe for more, or let me know in the comments any other lore changes you thought were weird in the game, along with any I've brought up which you may disagree with.